Welcome to the Spotlight Series. I'm your host, Scott Nerney. Don't forget to subscribe to these videos so that you will be notified as soon as a new one comes out, especially one with our author here. We love to talk about uh, movies and books. Julian Ayotte from our local publishing community. Welcome to the Spotlight Series. Thank you. A pleasure to be here. Always a pleasure. Talk to us a little bit about your background. Well, my background was mostly financial, quite frankly. Uh, the early part of my career was spent working as an executive for Textron in Providence until 1985 or so. And then I went into law firm administration at the request of um, a guy who uh, is well known in the state, a guy named Jack Partridge, who started the firm Partridge, Snow and Hahn. And uh, they needed an administrator, someone to uh, run the financial side of the company. So I, I took the job because Textron was getting a little bit out of hand with its merger and such, so it was time for a change. I stayed there for several years and then uh, went to a bigger law firm in Worcester called Myrick O'Connell, where I actually spent the rest of my career until 2002. That's when I retired. And quite frankly, the thought of writing one book never entered my mind um, until after I retired, I was looking in my drawer at home, my desk drawer, and I found this old manuscript that I had been working on. And it, it was so old that chapter one had turned yellow. Oh my. Because you gotta remember back in the 80s when I started this, there was no such thing as computers, it was electric typewriters. Mm. And you can remember old paper turning yellow. Yep. And uh, I, I was ready to chuck it in the basket and say, uh, retirement means I should be playing golf and tennis and enjoying myself. And my daughter said, who's an English major and an executive at GBH in Boston, she said, no, 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 Dad, this is good. You've got to finish this, which is not what I wanted to hear, quite frankly. <laughs> so it took me really almost 10 more years to finish the book because it was my first one and I really didn't know what the heck I was doing. But when I did finish it, she said, oh, my gosh, you've got to get this published. And, and this is how it began. And so in 2012, my first book, Flower of Heaven, came out. And from then on, it's been a deluge. Every time I come out with a book, within a month, one of my readers will come up to me and say, when's the next one coming out? As if they fall from the sky. People don't seem to realize that a book takes about a year to do it right from cover to cover with all of the formatting and editing and, and proofing, uh, it's, a, it's quite a job. But I've enjoyed the ride. So from 2012 to 2023, I, I promised my readers that I would do 10 books in 10 years. And my wife says, what a foolish thing to do. <laughs> and it was, but I, but I did it. And when I did it, um, I had all intentions of, of meeting the goal. Unfortunately, we had a couple of years with COVID interruptions and stuff where sure. uh, it was very difficult to focus on, on just writing because you had to focus on your health more than anything else. Right. Uh, but I'm close. This new book that I uh, just am coming out with uh, called In the Shadows of Vietnam, um, this is my ninth book. Ironically, I had started my ninth book, another book, um, when this opportunity came up, if I can explain. Yeah, so this is your first nonfiction, right? Uh, actually, uh, yeah, true story. Uh, yep. Codename Lily was a historical fiction. That was about a Belgian nurse, 22 years old, uh, who ran an escape network during World War II. She's real. But a few of the characters in the book are fictional because they didn't want their name associated for whatever reasons, sure. which I respect. So I, I had to call it historical fiction. But the facts in that book about Lily, uh, Micheline Dumont was her real name, those are true. Everybody that she was associated with in the book, uh, with the escape line, those are real names. And uh, it's still uh, an unbelievable seller. It's probably sold over 10,000 copies already, wow. and it's still going strong. So. Um, but then I went back to writing, you know, uh, mystery thrillers, novels, uh, and after uh, I wrote about three or four mystery thrillers, and my latest one was Spitting Image, which came out about a year ago. 
But I've got to tell you how all of this came about, this new book, if you don't mind. Sure, please. I read this article in April by Frank Lennon from the Providence Journal, who writes veterans articles. And he wrote this article about this young man who was a uh, infantryman in Vietnam in the late 60s. And uh, he made a promise uh, to God under a certain battle circumstances. And uh, he kept that promise years ago. So I was intrigued by the story. And I said, gee, his name was Phil Salwa, a very French name. I didn't know anything about him. I tried to find his email address. It took me about three hours to search the web. Finally, I got his email address because he was the national chaplain for the Vietnam Veterans of America. Not a small Yeah, that's a big tribute. step. It's a big step. So I sent him an email and I said, look, I just read your article in the journal. I'm fascinated by it. I'd like to do your biography. Would you be interested? And he said to me, Number one, he had been told by so many people to write his own autobiography, but he didn't have the patience to do so. He said he would, he would get too angry at himself at the time and the, and the detail that uh, it encountered. So he said, you have my permission to do so. Um, so I, I called a friend of mine, Paul Carancy, uh, who is a Rhode Island historian and a fellow author in the Association of Rhode Island Authors. And I asked him if he was interested in co-authoring the book with me because he's a historian. And I said, this is a true story and it's a lot of Rhode Island heritage. I thought he'd be interested. And he said, boy, oh, he, he jumped at the opportunity. Sure. But um, so we started to meet with this guy and we met with him uh, on mornings at breakfast five or six times in a row for about an hour and a half and we taped the recordings uh, we taped you know the our, our discussions just to make sure that we didn't get things wrong but he, he's now 74 years old and uh, I'll tell you a, a quick background about his story he had a normal childhood he was born in Woonsocket Rhode Island uh, but when he was six years old he had bad asthmatic attacks and his doctor recommended that he consider moving to California because the climate would be better for him. So his family up and moved to California, Covina, California, not too far from Los Angeles. And uh, he got out of high school like every other young guy, dated girls and, and such, and he went off to Cal Fullerton College, and uh, he didn't do well. He went there for one year, and he just didn't do well at all, and he dropped out. Unfortunately, this was during the Vietnam War, which now made him prime Eligible suspect for, draft? for the draft. Sure. And sure enough, within 12 to 15 months, he was drafted. And uh, he was sent for basic training in California. And within six months, he was sent to Vietnam. So here, here is the guy, he's 20 years old. He's just a, a little scrawny guy, curly hair. And you know, like he, he doesn't know anything about war and fighting. He learned very quickly. And the whole story really centered around an ambush that occurred with his platoon. And six of his men in this platoon were marooned out in the field. They were trapped there. And he said, we've got to go get these guys. If we don't get these guys, they're going to get killed. And his commanding officer said, you're crazy. You can't go out there. Wait till we get recruits. He says, if I wait for recruits, they'll all be dead. So he and another buddy decided they were going to try to rescue this guy. So before he went out there, he said, God, if you get me out of this mess without a scratch, I'll do anything you want. Very common promise that most infantrymen or soldiers make, right. but few keep because at the time it seems like the right thing to do. Look, so they say there are no atheists in foxholes, right? That's exactly right. So um, he does get out of it and he does rescue his men. Uh, one or two of them unfortunately died and didn't make it. But he eventually gets out of the service and uh, this is in 1970. Four years later, he happens to be at a seminary because he thought he would like to become a priest. 
Well, he's walking in the field saying his afternoon prayers, and all of a sudden he hears this voice in his head, and he says, what am I going nuts? I'm hearing this voice in my head. And the voice says, you remember that promise you made to me four years ago in Vietnam? And he's like shocked at himself, he's hearing this. He says, yes, I do remember that promise. Well, he says, I want you to become a priest. And so for the next 35 years, he becomes Father Philip Salwa, and all he does for his entire 35 years is cater to Vietnam veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder. Oh, before it was even really known. Yes, that's correct. And the reason he did this was because he had it. For 13 years after he came back from Vietnam, he'd never told a soul that this was eating him up inside. The thoughts of the war, the battle, the rescue, all of this, which is typical. There are some who master it, can get out of it with good uh, counseling. There are others who just have too much difficulty and the consequences are not good. Well, he decided he was gonna dedicate his life to veterans, and he did. He went to work in the Boston VA health system. He became the chief of chaplains in the Boston system, in charge of three different hospitals as the chief chaplain, counseling veterans day in and day out. He is the national chaplain for the Vietnam Veterans of America, and he's the national chaplain of the American Legion. And he's got the Silver Star from Vietnam. Hello? In April of next year, he will be inducted in the Rhode Island Heritage Hall of Fame. Oh, wow, that's an honor. Okay. Now, this is a guy who lived 15 minutes from me, and I never heard of him. I was disappointed in myself. I said to myself, I see this guy walking on the street. I wouldn't know who he was. He's that humble a man. He has 20 military medals, an equal amount of service medals from organizations like the, the Knights of Columbus and the, all of these organizations out there. He is unbelievable. He has so many awards, he, he doesn't remember them, half of them. But uh, I, I was fascinated uh, that, that I met him. I'm fascinated that I know him. I'm fascinated that I can call him my friend. Um, and, and this is a guy... <laughs> I live in Lincoln, he lives in North Smithfield. He's now 74 years old. I'm slightly older than that, but uh, you know, to, to, to know him is, is amazing. I had to write his story, and, uh, and this is it, called In the Shadows of Vietnam, The Gallant Life of Father Philip Salwa. Um, I'm proud to say that I wrote this book, very proud. And where is this available? Well, it's going to be available in about two weeks. This okay. is the proof copy, which we're finishing within the next day or two. Then we order the final copies, and on Amazon, paperback copies take about a week or two. And it'll be also on Kindle, and on every other ebook imaginable. Smashwords, Nook, Kobo, all of these places. The book will be everywhere. Uh, and we will have appearances uh, as well. Paul and I are planning to make several appearances at different uh, venues. And we will be initially selling the book at the uh, Small Business Saturday Shop Rhode Island at the Crown Plaza. Okay. The Saturday after Thanksgiving. And then the following week is the Aria's Authors Expo at the same location, the Crown Plaza. Those two locations, I definitely will be selling it, along with Paul selling it in his own booth. Um, and then before that, uh, my church is uh, St. Joseph's in Woonsocket, and I've been there since I was born, and I'll be selling them sometime in November there. So we expect hundreds of these copies to be gone uh, before the end of the year. Great. And what's the last book that you're looking at re uh, writing? Well, the last book I started is about Hawaii, um, and it's about Molokai, of all islands, which is not very heavily populated uh, because it was the leper colony uh, uh, back in the 1800s, 
and uh, not too many people like to visit leper colonies. Uh, as a matter of fact, it is the leper colony no longer exists because uh, you know they they had a, a remedy for that finally in certain medication, but uh, for some strange reason, the after effects of having a leper colony associated with Molokai um, mm -hmm. keeps the tourists away. I think there are probably three or 4,000 people on the whole island. And I, ironically, what I'm writing about is that in World War II, it was used by the Allied forces for all kinds of target practice and, and testing of various kinds of weapons. I can't really tell you much more than that. But no, the, but it's intriguing. For it sure. is intriguing. And I, this, I can tell you in all honesty that most of my books will keep you on the edge of your seat. There yeah. is a particular, uh, it's a pet peeve of mine that you don't guess the ending on my book until you actually get to it. And so jokingly, one of my author friends says, you give me five bucks, don't buy the book, I'll tell you how it ends. So, I mean, yeah, <laughs> that's, 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 a, that's a joke. But it's a, it, it, I like to write, and I have to tell you, in all honesty, I don't know where my book is going from one day to the next. I couldn't tell you what I'm going to write tomorrow. I can't tell you where it's go how it's going to end, when it's going to end, but it all comes together. Every single one of my books has come together. Uh, I, I have reviews on Amazon that blow my own mind because they keep... I just sold books at the Big E in Springfield yep. and uh, a woman sent me an email and she said, I just read uh, Diamond and Pearls and I loved it. Now I'm on Disappearance, and I'm liking that one too, so I'm going to be ordering all of your books, and I can't wait to see you again next year. Now this is a, I, I mean, I, I, this is not Ring. I, I don't know yeah. this woman from Adam. I, she's on my mailing list now, of course, because she sent me an email to tell me this, and the email is in my, my brochure along with my website so that people can get good descriptions of what every book is about. I don't have trouble selling my books. I really don't, and I, and I and I really believe it's because it's a, the subjects are interesting. Mm. I mean, I've I've written about reincarnation. I've written about the witness protection program. I've written about a female burglar. I mean, I've written about the you know uh, the affairs of a young priest with a tour guide in Paris and the consequences of that years later. Those were my first two books. But all of this in summary, comes to the conclusion of trying to get one of my books in film. Um, so I took some time off between books, maybe two years ago, and I decided to write scripts for at least my first five books. And I thought that if I did write scripts, I'd at least have a chance of some producer taking a look at it and saying, boy, this is a story I like. From doing it just from a, a novel is, is very difficult because they have to read the novel. Right. And if they're going to read a the novel, they prefer to read a script. And I was told that years ago. So I wrote five scripts. I wrote Flower of Heaven and the sequel, Diamond and uh, Dangerous Bloodlines. And then I wrote the third one, which is A Life Before, and then I wrote Disappearance, and finally I wrote Codename Lily. Five books, and I wrote five scripts. Now, this is a guy who's never written a script in his life. So there's a learning curve, and you correct things, and you go back, and you look at how other people did it, and the consequences are hopefully you did it the right way. If not, at least the producer can fix the script, but he's got to first read it. Right. Okay. So. I went on this website called Inktip, which is a website that producers go to to review scripts that are written for movies, and it's exclusive for producers. And I've been on there now for almost two years, but in the two years, I've had 1,800 hits on my scripts, 1,800. So I'm thinking to myself, wow. As my wife would say, it only takes one. Yeah. It only takes one. So I'm, and within the last three weeks, 
I've had five scripts downloaded. And, you know, this guy is dancing on air right now because the fact they actually downloaded my scripts is a strong beginning. You can't get them to give you an option on a movie unless they've read your script. Right. And so I'm, I'm on my way, as they say. Whether it happens before I die, who knows. But, you know, I think before you get to step two, you got to take step one. Well, it's a learning process. It's I a mean, long, you, you took it from a, a dusty manu partial manuscript in a right. draw that's right. into the electronic age and then into a book. I mean, <laughs> I, I think you're paving all your own paths. I hope so. Uh, you know, if you had asked me years ago that I'd be working on my 10th book, I, I would have said, you're crazy, you know, there's no way. And to this day, to this day, my wife literally says to me, who are you? Where does this come from? You know, how do you get these ideas? And I tell her, they just come. I mean, I, I, I will take a body. You find a body on the beach in Provincetown. You find another body on the beach in the Boston Harbor. They look alike. They're the spitting image of each other. Ironically, there are two other people whose wallets they're carrying who also look like the two dead bodies. So we have four people who look alike. What could possibly be happening? Read the book and you'll find out. And it, people have read this thing and they're saying, oh my God. And it all revolves around in vitro fertilization. The possibilities are unbelievable, much of which I didn't know and I have to tell you, 90% of writing a book is about research. If you do it wrong, you're going to look like a fool mm. because they're going to tell you, you know that restaurant you talked about, that wasn't there in that year. That was, that was already burned down. That's why a lot of people write such pure fiction that it can't be brought back to them. Exactly. Yeah. When I wrote my first book, before I had it published, I had this young priest who was having an affair with a French tour guide. And I, I had them having the affair in the Hotel de Ville in Paris. And my daughter, very bright, says to me, Dad, you do know that the Hotel de Ville in Paris is City Hall. I said, wow, geez. No, I didn't. Well, now we've upped the game. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I don't think they were having an affair in City Hall. So I had to change the hotel. That's when I realized that... You really have to do your homework uh, to get the facts right. Yeah. And if you do, people have told me, you have taken me to places in this world that I've never been to, but now I feel like I've been there. Mm. That's, a, that's quite a compliment. Yeah. I mean, you know, and it's because some of the, I've been to a lot of these places in my books, and I like to describe them for people who may never get there. And it adds to the book because... It's intriguing to them uh, in some place that they always wanted to go to and now they feel after all the description, um, they, feel, they feel accomplished. They feel like they've done it. I look at a lot of good books that have a lot of good descriptions, especially if someone's been there, almost like a liter literary virtual reality. Right. Like I can picture what's happening in the book. My wife often asks me, how can you read two different books at the same time? I may have one at the house and one when we yeah, travel because sure. I'm just reading a story. I'm reading someone's, how can you watch two different TV shows which you know, you, which at you the do. same time? You can, yeah. Of course you can. Yeah. Of course. It's a good analogy because yeah. you're right. You can, you can. I mean, I don't know that I would sit there and read two novels at once, but if I had the opportunity and, uh, and I had the resources, a book here and a book there, yeah. uh, I suppose I would. I suppose I would. I don't see anything wrong with it. Yeah. I mean, you watch two television series at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. That's a good point. Yeah. That's good. Well, thank you very much. It's been an honor talking to you. I wish you a great deal of luck on number nine and The Shadows of Vietnam come. is, uh, I think, will be a big success because of his Rhode Island connections. And uh, after he moved to California and, and such, he actually came back here and became a uh, priest with the La Salette Order. And then his career was all in Boston until 2013 when his mom died. 
and she had a house in North Smithfield, which she left to him. They so all come back. They all come back, and he's here, and he's going to die here. Mm. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank me. you.